I've been looking forward to preaching this Sunday's um, sermon since we first started in the Gospel of Mark last October. Uh, This is my favorite verse in the Gospel of Mark. And um, it's not just that it's my favorite verse. I I think it's the pinnacle of Mark's testimony about why... Uh, this news about Jesus Christ is good news. And so I've been very excited about this and, and uh, working, um, looking forward to this for a long time. Thank you, Heather. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us that we've been singing about. You are gracious and compassionate. And Lord, our, this uh, text this, this morning is uh, short, but it is no less powerful for its size. So I ask you, Father, that uh, what your Holy Spirit intended this verse to accomplish as he inspired it to your servant uh, Mark, who wrote it down on parchment, Lord, for us to read today. I pray that your purpose in this verse will be accomplished. I pray, Father, that as we hear this word this morning, that your spirit will minister to us and that the fruit of that in our hearts and souls, Lord, will be comfort and peace. I pray for peace, Lord, to reign. I pray for security in our hearts that we will not ever question, because of the promise of this verse, that we will never question whether our salvation hangs by a thread, but that we will know in confidence that our salvation is held by a great, uh, a divine cord of omnipotent grace. We thank you for what you have done through Jesus Christ and ask that you would make that clear to us this morning. In his name we pray. Amen. Uh, have you heard of Princeton University? I'm sure many of you have. Uh, uh, Princeton University is a fairly old school in, in the, um, on the eastern seaboard. And, and uh, Princeton, uh, the, the first principal of Princeton University was a man with a wonderful name, Archibald Alexander. Um, a wonderful name. Uh, I think we should have named some of our kids, or at least one of our children, Archibald. Um, but uh, Archibald Alexander said once that, he said, all my theology is reduced to this narrow compass. He means it boils down to this. All my theology is reduced to this narrow compass. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. This verse in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, shows us that I think Archibald, Alexander, and Mark, the writer of this gospel, have this in common. They have the same center to their theology. Look again with me, Mark 10, verse 45, that Josiah read for us. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is a purpose statement. Part of his purpose is he came to give his life as a ransom for many. Is that in addition to serving? No, I think it's he came to serve by giving his life as a ransom for many. This is the, according to Jesus' own mouth, from his own lips, we have his mission boiled down to its solid core. The purpose Jesus came, he says, is to come and serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Mark began his book, his gospel, which means good news. As you know, unlike any of the other three gospels by Matthew, Luke, or John, Mark's is unique. Mark did not start with with a genealogy. He did not start with a a historical or theological context. He did not start, start by saying, and now, dear Theophilus, I'm going to set forward an orderly account of the things Jesus said. He did not start as John did. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. He began with this announcement, a dramatic announcement of good news. Mark 1 verse 1. Mark 1 verse 1 begins this way. He says, the beginning of the gospel, that is the good news, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's Mark's beginning to his gospel, to his book. For eight chapters after that, from that point on, for eight chapters, Mark builds his theme and builds up why this is good news by showing us the bad news. You could say it, put it that way. 
what he does to show us the bad news, he shows us for eight chapters, layer after layer of evidence of who Jesus is, that's good news, but of why we need him, and that's the bad news. Eight chapters of evidence of how badly the world needed Jesus, how badly we need Jesus still. James Hamilton is a professor at Southern uh, Baptist Seminary, and he said this about the first eight chapters of Mark's gospel. Jesus has shown the world its bankruptcy so that the world might feel its need for the bailout he provides. That's a poignant language in today's economy, isn't it? Jesus has shown the world its bankruptcy so that, he might, so that the world might feel its need for the bailout out he provides. He has condemned the world in order to save it. His teaching with authority exposes and condemns the failures of human tradition. His healing the sick and raising the dead judges and triumphs over the effects of sin and the outworkings of the curse in the world. Casting out demons, he reveals that he has entered the home of the strong man, Satan, bound him, weighed him in the scales, and found him wanting. And he is now plundering his possessions. I love that. He carries on. Jesus brings salvation through judgment. And in response, his fame spreads. The people marvel and everyone glorifies God. If you want to get the book where he says that, it's James Hamilton's book, um, uh, The Glory of God in Salvation Through Judgment. Fantastic, very large book that covers all of the Bible and shows the uh, singular theme from all of Scripture. Well, if the first half of Mark, Jesus' ministry in Galilee, if this shows us our need for salvation and introduces us to our Savior, Jesus Christ, that begins to beg a question. It begins to move us as readers to begin to ask, well, tell me more about this salvation. If Mark is showing us why we need a Savior and who the Savior is, now he needs to show us, I pray, he needs to show us how Jesus saves us. That's where Mark comes to, and he makes this clear in the last half of his book. The last half of Mark does this as Jesus heads toward Jerusalem, toward his death. And this verse, Mark 10, 45, reveals three profound facts about Jesus' death. This verse reveals the meaning of Jesus' death. It reveals what Jesus' death accomplished. Now, the the gospel is announced here loud and clear, but the disciples at this point in time did not understand. They didn't get it. It was a long time later when they remembered the words of Jesus... Uh, obviously under the guidance of the Holy Spirit and they remembered what he'd said and they remembered what he says in this verse and they began to understand the implications of it and that writing of the implications of this verse fills up a great deal of the New Testament. But here there are three truths in this verse that are key to Christianity. It all comes down to this narrow compass, Archibald Alexander said. So if this morning, if this morning you want to know what Christianity is, this is it. This morning, if you want to know what the gospel is, the good news, this is its fiery core and burning center. If you have ever wondered how on earth the death of a 33-year-old Jewish rabbi 2,000 years ago can save us, can save sinners like us, the answer is in Mark 10 verse 45. So listen up. And for the rest of us who know this already and we believe this, we are disciples of Christ. We have committed ourselves to following him. We do trust in his name for salvation. If that's you this morning, then we need to stay centered in the gospel. We need this to continue to be the center of what we believe daily. As it has been said, the gospel is not the doorway to Salvation, the gospel is not the doorway to heaven. The gospel is the path. So we need to do more than just follow Jesus' example. He does give us an example in this verse. Even the Son of Man came not to serve, but or sorry, not to be served, but to serve, he says. Surely Jesus does give us an example here. We talked about that that last week. And D was that last week? Yeah, that was that's right. D equals C two something greater, right? 
Discipleship equals called to something greater. Jesus gave us an example to follow. But he gave us so much more than an example. He didn't just say, follow me. He said, trust in me. Believe in me. He also calls us to be centered in his gospel. And this is it. So three profound truths from Mark 10 verse 45. And the first one is this. Jesus' death was a ransom. Verse 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom. The ancient idea of a... If, maybe you've seen that Mel Gibson movie. Uh, I think it was called Ransom. Uh, where Mel Gibson is a wealthy man. His uh, child is kidnapped. And so he's, the rest of the movie is about uh, convincing the kidnappers they're raising the ransom while actually setting out to rescue his child and free the child. A profound, uh, powerful movie. The thing is that that's not the idea of ransom that we have in the New Testament. That's not a biblical idea of ransom. Is is quite like se- setting someone free from a kidnapper. That's That gives a, a, a misunderstanding. The ransom was about paying a price, yes, but to set something or someone free from a legal indenture. Not a crime of kidnapping, but from a legal indenture. Whether that be a piece of land or a cow or a slave taken in payment of a debt. If the legal ransom was paid, freedom is the result. And so you see the payment of a ransom... How many parties are involved, do you think, in the payment of a ransom? Two. There are two parties involved, and neither one of them is the person who needs to be free. Think about that for a second. What Jesus says, I came to give my life as a ransom. And neither one of the involved parties are the one who needs to be free, which is you and me as sinners. There are two parties, the one who pays the debt and the one to whom the debt is paid. G.K. Chesterton said Christianity is a superhuman paradox whereby two opposite passions may blaze beside each other. These two blazing realities that are are what Christianity is, these two blazing passions in the heart of God that are, are what Christianity comes down to are the justice of God and the love of God. God's justice requires something, doesn't it? To say that God is always right and that he wins right in the end, that he upholds right in the end of all things, requires something. God's got to do something if this is true. If God is going to be just, some things must follow, right? God's justice requires that criminals who break his law must pay the price. Do we agree with that? Do we believe that? certainly not asking anyone to believe that because I say it. I'm asking you to wrestle with the fact that the Bible says it. God's justice requires that criminals who break his law pay the price. But God's love, if God is love, and if God is a a core attribute, if love is a core attribute of God, then love also requires certain things to happen. God, if he is love, must do certain things as a result. Would you agree with that? And if God is love, then his love requires that somehow this price must be paid. And if we who are sinners who are in prison because we are in debt to his law, if we cannot pay our own price, if we cannot purchase our own freedom, his love requires that somehow by grace that freedom be purchased, that price be paid, that debt be satisfied. Two opposite passions burn in the heart of God. Justice or righteousness. It's the same idea in the, in the Greek New Testament. And love. Not good and evil. God is not the good side of the force versus the dark side of the force. God is not the yin and the yang. You know that black and white curvy symbol thing in the circle. Balance out of all nature between positive and negative or light and dark or good and evil. This is not Christianity. But there are two realities at the essence of all that the Bible has shown us who God is. There's much more I'm sure that could be said that's not in the Bible. But what the Bible has showed us is enough. 
And what the Bible shows us is that God is both justice and love blazing together, not in opposition to each other, but in tension with one another. The holy, united purpose and plan of God is to bring about victory of justice and love in the paradox of the cross of Jesus Christ. So I would say this, that the climax of world history, if we were to read a book, the, 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 the best part of that book of world history, when we just can't put it down and it's one o'clock in the morning and you really should go to sleep because you've got to get up for work in the next morning, but you've got to find out what happens next. That part in the book of world history is when Jesus hung on the cross. When the passionate justice and the love of God burned hottest and brightest 2,000 years ago just outside the city of Jerusalem. So later on in Mark, Mark writes about this event, the cross of Christ, and he shows this truth that God's justice and love burned brightly at that moment in the death of Jesus. Look with me at Mark chapter 15. Verse 33 to 39. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the son of God. The darkness over the whole land signified that God's anger against evil, against crime, against every sin in human history, past or present or future, no matter how great a sin or how seemingly small a sin, that every crime and every sin and every act of deliberate or passive rebellion against God was punished. The anger for that sin was poured out on Jesus Christ when he died. No wonder he cries out for the only time that I am aware of when he cries out, Lemas, lema, uh, Eloi, Eloi, my God, my God, not my Father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? No wonder he cried out. Feeling abandoned by his Father for the first time ever in eternity. But every sin was paid for. Right then. The debt was paid in full. In the book of John, verse, chapter 19, verse 20, when it says, Jesus cried out, It is finished! And he breathed, and he gave up his spirit. That word, it is finished in Greek, tetelestai, is the same word that a Greek banker in ancient days might write across a, a, a bill of debt when that bill is finally paid up in full. It's the same thing as saying paid in full. It is finished, tetelestai. And this is what Jesus cried out. It's finished. The debt is paid. That was God's justice in Mark chapter 15. But then Mark carries on without a, missing a beat and he starts talking about something not that happened there where the Roman centurion saw the Son of God dying on a cross, but something that happened simultaneously across the city. Look at that verse in Mark 15 there. Mark goes on right along to talk about what's happening in the temple. And he says, in the temple this veil was torn in two, from top to bottom. And this veil, as you know, is a, about the thickness of a man's hand. It was supernaturally torn down the middle. A miracle showing that people are now free through Jesus' death to come into the very presence of God, not be kept outside the holy holies that the temple divided from the outer sanctum. 
all people are now free to come by this miracle to know God, to live in his universe as friends through the ransom Jesus paid to set us free. I translate John 3.16 like this. For God loved the world like this. He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And that was God's love. In those verses in Mark 15, the justice of God and the love of God at the same climax of history. Well, Jesus was our ransom. He paid our ransom. But the second thing I see in Mark 10 verse 45 is that Jesus is the Son of Man. Jesus is the Son of Man. Look at the verse again. Mark 10 verse 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I am glad that I had to do kindergarten twice. I am glad I am a slow reader. I was a late bloomer. I am glad that um, it takes me a long time to read a book. Sometimes I talk to people who've read a book that I've also read, and as we're talking about the book, I wonder, did we read the same book? There are people like my wife, I'm not saying this about her, about the reading the book thing, but there are people like my wife who read voraciously and quickly. She burns through books like they're made of paper. Well, they are made of paper, but she, she goes quickly through a book. You know what I'm saying. And I don't. I'm a very slow reader. But you see, it's good to read the Bible slowly, which is why I thank God that my facility in Greek is so very, very poor. I'm like a kindergartner reading the Greek language in the New Testament. And I have to read slowly. Every word I work out with fear and trembling. But it's good to read the Bible slowly, to pay attention to the Bible's literary genres and the nuances of theme and style and syntax and grammar. This is important. I've heard John Piper say, in the end, this is why God created thinking which led to education, which led to literacy, was so that we could understand his word. Think about it that way. Well, if you do this with Mark, if you pay attention, careful attention to the nuances of Mark's gospel, I trust that you will not fail, as many have, to see what Mark's really getting at, to, to catch it, to see why all this gospel could not be more relevant to you. People sometimes say silly things like, well, that's just religion. Or, it doesn't affect me. But in the first eight chapters of Mark, we saw why this matters. Evil affects all of us. I wish it didn't. But it does. Jesus confronted evil and Jesus cast out evil spirits, demons. He didn't solve the problem there. He acknowledged the problem there and he announced his war against evil there. But evil is a problem that affects all of us. Sickness and disease affect all of us. Jesus came against it and healed people. Not once for all, not finally and fully, but to announce his war against sickness and disease. And one day, he's going to win. Jesus showed us that sin affects all of us. When the paralyzed man in Mark chapter 2 wanted healing, Jesus said, son, your sins are forgiven first. Sin affects all of us. I wish it didn't, but it does. Yet Jesus came and he announced war against sin and he forgave sin and he taught us to love, which is the overcoming of sin. Death affects all of us. Doesn't it? Jesus raised the dead. He said to the little girl, Talitha kum. I say to you, little girl, get up. He said to Lazarus who was dead and had no ears to hear, Lazarus, come forth. Jesus raised the dead and then he died once and for all 
to set us free from all of this sin, this evil, this sickness, this death. The Son of God became the Son of Man in order to save us. This is a beautiful truth of biblical theology. Nothing matters more for you and me or the guy that was like walking his dog along Dallas Road right now. Nothing matters more. And this matters because Jesus is the Son of Man. That's why it's relevant. That's why it affects us because Jesus is the Son of Man. Jesus calls himself the Son of Man 14 times in Mark's Gospel. It's his favorite title for himself. Not Pastor Jesus or Rabbi Jesus or anything like that that would be silly. He calls himself the Son of Man and it's a loaded title. He calls himself the Son of Man 14 times and I've got them here. He says, the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. The Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. The Son of Man must suffer, be rejected, be killed and rise again. He says, if you're ashamed of me, the Son of Man will be ashamed of you when he comes in glory. He said, the Son of Man will rise from the dead. He said, the scriptures foretold that the Son of Man will suffer. The Son of Man is going to be delivered to men, killed, and will rise. The Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and condemned to death, mocked, spat on, flogged, killed, and will rise again on the third day. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. They will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to him who betrays the Son of Man. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners as his cross came close. And lastly, I am And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds. And to that last claim, I am. And you will see the Son of Man coming with power and at the the right hand of power coming with the clouds. To that last claim of deity, the high priest cried out in Mark 14, 64, Blasphemy! And he condemned him to death for saying that. He did not misunderstand what Jesus said. He got it. And he said, that's blasphemy. And he was right. Unless it was true. You see, the Son of Man is not the opposite to the Son of God. The prophet Daniel saw a vision of the future in which one like a Son of Man which means a human descended from Adam. In Hebrew, it's literally a son of Adam. Uh, One like a son of man was lifted up to heaven, equal to God, exalted in power and glory. That's Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. So don't think the son of man means Jesus is merely one of us. The son of man means the son of God has become one of us in order that he can legally take our place, in order that he can legally and rightfully pay our ransom, that he can be our substitute. How could he be our substitute if he wasn't one of us? That's why the Son of God came, to become the Son of Man and give his life as a ransom for many. He came in weakness. He will come again in power. He died in shame. He ascended in glory. He was condemned in death and God vindicated him him in raising the kingdom, sorry, raising him to life. God vindicated him. He took our place as a man and he rules there at the right hand of God now as God. Daniel 7.14 predicted the kingdom of the Son of Man. Daniel 7.14. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. This is the kingdom, the inheritance of the Son of Man from Daniel 7 verse 14. 
And Daniel 7 verse 27 reveals that in the end, we who belong to the Son of Man, we who are his people, will inherit his kingdom. Daniel 7 verse 27 says, And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. Their kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey them. What the Son of Man has inherited, He gives to us, to those who are His people. No more evil. No more sickness. No more sin. No more death. No more tear, no more sadness, no more crying, no more mourning. All put to an end. There is only then going to be goodness and health and love and life forever. And we can't even imagine it, can we? But we want to try. And all this is because the ransom Jesus paid sets us free. Because he is the Son of Man. And the third and final profound truth that I see in Mark 10 verse 45 is this. That Jesus died to free many. This is what makes the good news beautiful news for you and me. This is what makes the feet of the people who carry good news beautiful feet. And I don't even like feet. But we've got to say the feet of someone who carries good news are beautiful. It's this third revelation which secures my hope and fuels my joy and empowers my worship of the justice and the love of God who conceived this plan of salvation. This rescue mission of ransom and atonement. We've got to worship and praise God when we begin to see what he has wrought, what he has done from eternity. And this is why. The profound thing here is the word many. The profound thing here is the word many. For even the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. 300 years ago John Gill a Baptist pastor noted that from this verse that he said many are not all and he's right many are not all it does not say that Jesus came to give his life as a ransom for all it says many John Gill is right about that Jesus' death does not set everyone free, although certainly it could. Certainly it has the power to do so. We must agree with that, right? But Mark here is not writing, nor is Jesus speaking about hypotheticals. He is speaking about actual reality. Not what could be true, but what is true. Many here is not everyone, but many is also not a few. It's not a small number. The purpose of the word many here in Mark 10 verse 45 is not to give an estimate of the number of people that are freed by Jesus' ransom. That's not the purpose of the word. The purpose of the word here is to give a specific assurance and comfort. The purpose of the word many here is to name them. Who is it that are set free by the blood of Jesus Christ? And Mark says many. Jesus says many, I should say. The word here gives assurance and comfort and hope and security to you and to me and to all who believe. When Jesus said for many, or in in Greek actually it's anti, uh, the word anti is a preposition. He says for many, and the, the preposition there means like as a substitute, as a substitute for many. But when Jesus here says, for many, just like he's quoting, I believe, um, or I, I think he's quoting here from Daniel, just like the Son of Man is a title taken from the book of Daniel. I think the word many here is a loaded term. He was boring from that book of Daniel, from the prophet, and Daniel prophesied in chapter 9, verse 27, that the Messiah, the Christ, would make a firm covenant with the many. And Jesus uses this word many only one other time in his speaking in the book of Mark. Jesus uses this word many and maybe you already thought of where he uses it. We recount it every Sunday. The only other time that Jesus uses this word many was at the Last Supper. When he said, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. 
Mark 14, 24. Many is not Mennonites. Many is not Baptists. Many is not Pentecostals. I got to hear an amen to that. (laughs) We can do it with hands raised. Many is not the good people. Many is not the clean people or the qualified people. Many is not the people born in the right country or to the right family or to the people who were baptized as babies. Many is not about the color of your skin. Many is not about the religion of your ancestors or least of all of your own reputation. That's not what many means. Many is a covenant word. Many is not for everyone, everyone, but it is anyone who wants it. It's a covenant word, a word of promise, a word of security. It's a word that promises everyone who asks by faith to be included in the promise, to be covered in the covenant, will be free. That's what many means. Many is you and me. Again, Pastor John Gill, 300 years ago, said, This ransom price was paid for them in their place and stead by Christ as their substitute who put himself in their legal place and laid himself under obligation to pay their debts and clear their scores and redeem them from all their iniquities and the evil consequences of them. And this he did for many. Paul says in Colossians 2 verse 14, he did this by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Jesus said this in John 8, 36. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So ask, believe, and be free. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the hope that your word secures. We thank you for the gospel that your word announces. We thank you for the faith that proceeds from the word of Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, faith that justifies, faith that secures your imputed righteousness faith that releases the promise of the Holy Spirit upon us, faith that secures our hope and our future, faith that as you say, faith with hearing in Galatians chapter 3, faith with hearing is what perfects us by which you finish the work that you've started in us. We thank you for the faith in Jesus Christ that we have as a gift from you. We give you praise and glory, Lord, for what you have begun in us and what you will continue to do with us. We thank you that you will finish what you've started until the day of Christ Jesus. We thank you in his name. Amen.